ett av de länder som är vad kan man säga föregångsländer när det gäller just social innovation det är Storbritannien. I många år så har de jobbat med entreprenörskap och social innovation och därför är det ju lite extra spännande att blicka just dit. Och nu kommer vi få ha tre personer som kommer just från Storbritannien så det gäller att vässa våra engelska öron lite. Och först ut så ska vi prata om framtiden. Vi ska spana in i kristallkula. För hur kommer de sociala innovationerna, det sociala entreprenörskapet, att se ut om en tio år? Och vilka utmaningar är det som, som det sociala entreprenörskapet och innovationerna står inför? Louise Paulford, hon är chef för Social Innovation Exchange som är ett av de stora nätverken i världen och hon är med oss här idag och hon ska prata om detta. Välkommen upp. Welcome up, Louise. Hope this simple to work. Um, thank you so much. It's so nice to be here. Um, I love coming to Malmö. Um, mainly because of the wonderful colleagues that I have in Erica and her team here, but also because um, I sometimes I can look a bit Swedish. Um, I do a lot of work in Latin America and Asia, and I always look completely different to everybody else. I'm always the blonde girl. Um, and so it's really nice to be here. But despite looking a bit Swedish, I understand um, the word tack and hey. Um, and usually when one does a presentation, you would comment on what has happened in, in the last presentation. You would comment on what is said before, um, and you would very quickly change your slides to make sure that you don't contradict them too much. Um, I don't speak Swedish, and so I can't do that. So I could gather a little bit of what you were saying just now. I'd love to learn more in the break. Um, and I hope that what I say is not too contradictory to what you said. And I'm pretty sure it won't be, because us in the social innovation world tend not to ever disagree with each other. I um, don't know how many social innovation conferences you've been to. I've been to a lot. And uh, everyone agrees with everyone, uh, which is great. But clearly, uh, we need to do a bit more. Because if social innovation is as effective as we need it to be, we should not be facing the challenges with such a mess in our approach, in the way that we're approaching our challenges today. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about social innovation in the next 10 years. I'm certainly not going to say what it looks like. Um, but what I am going to do is ask some controversial, well, potentially controversial questions. Um, because I really think we need to push ourselves. I really think we're not doing enough. And I really need to think, I really think we need to ask ourselves some very hard questions about what we can do more and which institutions we need to push to do more, but also what we need to do more within ourselves. So, um, I run an organization called the Social Innovation Exchange. We are all six. We're a global network of organizations around the world who are working in this field across sectors, across themes. And I guess the reason that they've asked me to speak in the method section is we're obsessed with the question how. How does innovation happen? How do people do more of it? How do we encourage more of it? And we all know, we've probably all seen this slide hundreds of times before, or a version of it. We all know that in the last few years, last 10 years, social innovation has become more accepted as a practice. Um, the fields of traditional innovation have started thinking in a more social way, they've been thinking more about society. We all know that innovation parks that have existed for years are now being called, and, and we have a new version of social innovation parks. We have social innovation camps, we have funds, we have government offices, we have prizes, we have social impact bonds, we have social finance tools. We all know all of this stuff, and it's great. Um, and we know also, this is a recent report by um, the Economist Intelligence Unit a couple of weeks ago, um, where they developed what they call a social innovation index, ranking different organizations uh, against their, what they call their social innovation capacity. So they have five measures of um, 
institutional frameworks, finance availability, um, capacity, entrepreneurial capacity in people that Alistair will talk about. Um, and they've ranked around 50 countries, I think, um, according to their innovation capacity, which is great. But they haven't in any way tried to measure the effect of this innovation capacity on the people's lives in their societies. And we also know that um, there's a lot more, and um, Beatrice will talk about this probably a little bit in terms of government innovation. There are lots and lots of what work centres now all over the UK and all over the world that are looking at better evidence to try and prove what we're doing is better and try and prove what we're doing can be more effective or try and understand how our work can be more effective. But still, we have things like the migrant crisis that come and hit us and none of us know what to do with it. And we spend far too long having different kind of discussions rather than thinking effectively about how to solve some of these challenges. And we know it's global, and so this is, this is some of the work that we do. We host events all over the world talking about lots of these issu different issues, whether it's on a city's level, or a couple of weeks ago we were in <laughs> Colombia talking about the um, social innovation in divided societies, um, Colombia being a particularly divided society at the moment, following its referendum. But as I said, compared to the scale of these challenges that we're facing today and that we're about to face, these efforts are still fairly marginal. And this is a slide again, which you've probably all seen before, a um, well-known uh, writer and thinker on this, this topic um, put this slide in a presentation, Charlie Ledbetter from the UK in uh, but probably about like 1985 or something that explained why we need innovation. But still, even though we know what we've got isn't good enough, I don't think we're really focusing enough on how what we need is changing and how quickly the pace of change is. So we have some of the deep social challenges that we need to face today, like the migrant crisis, like aging, like young people, um, like divided societies all over the world. But we also have some serious challenges arising very, very quickly. And so what we need has changed and what's possible is extremely different to what it was five years ago, but also last year and probably last week. So digital disruption has been a big thing. The world's largest taxi company owns no taxis. The world's largest hotel chain does not own a single room. This goes on. And I was in, um, I was really lucky last week to be in Seoul in South Korea, not looking very Korean, um, with the mayor of Seoul, who um, many of you will know as a leader in this field. He has been a human rights activist. He has been a, a social organizer. Of, of, uh, he ran an organization called the Hope Institute in, um, in Seoul, which focused on community level um, bottom-up initiatives, and then he became the mayor of Seoul, a city of 12 million people with its fair share of um, social challenges to face. And what he was um, hosting last week was something called the Future Innovation Forum, and he talks about something called the fourth. He calls the fourth industrial revolution, and his challenge to the global participants that were there, but also the people of Seoul was how do we cope with the fourth industrial revolution? What is it? And so what we did is we spent some time around Seoul looking at different projects and looking at different things that are happening in the city. And we identified some of the characteristics in Seoul of this fourth industrial revolution. We looked at things like distributed systems. We looked at things like re rebuilding chains of production. There is whole areas of Seoul where their garment industry is not made in a big factory. It's one person in each building that has a different role in, in making the garments. It's distributed system. We looked at things like zero mile production consumption as a result of this and moved to this local manufacturing and, and moved to doing things with our hands, this whole maker movement that we're seeing. And this fourth industrial revolution brought us some really big questions for us. So we talked a lot about what this means for our city centers. Shopping forever 
has been the main activity that people do in the cities. But when people are not shopping in the cities anymore and they're shopping online, what does that mean for our city centres? The jobs that we have in the future are going to change. People are not going to be working in the office blocks. And pretty soon this will happen. So what does that mean for our city centres? How do we repurpose the buildings? How do we redesign what we have already? But also there's a whole question around ethics and technology. Who manages our data? When everything is done online? What do we do about drones? What do we do about blockchain? Those things that I really still don't quite understand. What kind of skills are we going to need? What are our young people going to need to do? How do we still nurture things like creativity? There was a uh, presentation that I saw last week where um, actually uh, making some predictions about jobs in the future and the jobs that aren't going to be lost so easily are those creative ones. So how do we still nurture things like creativity when there's such a focus on the Internet of Things and data and all of those things? And how do we deal with the shadow side of all of this? Social innovation isn't necessarily always good. Finding new ways of doing things doesn't always have the best effect on people and society. So how do we make sure that this move to the future has a positive effect on people's lives and doesn't just damage them? And I think what we really need to do at this point is think about how we change systems. And so the presentation, um, if I understood it at all, <laughs> and that I saw earlier on, was thinking a little bit about that, right? How do you not just, or maybe not, but <laughs> anyway, how do, you, um, how do we stop all of these? How do we make sure that social innovation is more than the sum of its parts? How do we not stop all of these brilliant, tiny innovations that are happening, but how do we make the most of them? How do we use them to make governments, to make big institutions, reframe their thinking. So the question is not about tiny communities only, it's about how governments can change their approach so we don't need all of these tiny initiatives. Okay. And so I'm gonna stop there, but these are, the, I am gonna stop there. Um, but these are some of the things I think we need going forward. And um, I hope that we'll have some of this discussion later on on the, the role of different institutions in doing it. Yes, we will keep on talking to Louise yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, in a while. And thank you so much uh, Pleasure. for now. And uh, yeah, give them a call. <laughs> Louise, please, please have a seat here. Yes, please. Um, because we do like this, that we have Louise, we have Alistair and Beatrice, and all of those will have 10 minutes. And after that, we wrap it up and have some questions for all three of you. So the next speaker, he uh, is, um, uh, well, could you learn to be uh, a social entrepreneur? This is the next question. School for Social Entrepreneurship in, in UK. Here's the director, Alistair Wilson. Welcome up. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's wonderful to be here. Um, keen to explore the question of how people who understand the problem, who have a vested interest in the problem, it's their lives, their communities, their families, their issues, how do we get those people, how do we unleash those people in terms of offering new innovations, new solutions, how do we get those people driving change in communities? Because if we managed to do that, that would truly be a, a scalable force in terms of change. But not only that, it would target the issues. It would, it would root change in the poorest communities where change was most needed. So is there a possibility of supporting people who really understand these issues firsthand and therefore can author really appropriate solutions. Is there a kind of methodology of supporting those people to allow them to have a go at authoring change in their communities and make change happen? So that's, that's partly our theory of change at the School for Social Entrepreneurs. And I just want to, it's not rocket science, it's not too difficult, but unbelievably, it's done very rarely. And I want to kind of lift the lid on what we do at the School for Social Entrepreneurs that really enables people from all walks of life and all backgrounds to begin to have a go at authoring solutions to issues that they face in their community. Um, the, 
The school was started by this chap here who's 10 years dead now, uh, Michael Young, who in his lifetime authored a whole pile of solutions, Open University, Language Line, Education Extra, Consumers Association, Witch Magazines, 40 other institutions uh, which are still going today, many of which are global. Um, and when Michael came up with the concept of the School for Social Entrepreneurs, he, after spending a lifetime of being a social entrepreneur, he knew that you can't teach social entrepreneurship. It's a doing word. And therefore, he set out the School for Social Entrepreneurs as an action learning institution. So what does that mean? Well, basically, you don't get in unless you have a real live idea, either at start, trade, or scale level. So we go all the way through the levels. And then you join with your idea. You've got this idea that you've dreamt up in your bedroom. And you then join a cohort of 20 people who meet together only for 12 days throughout a year in blocks of three days. When they meet together, they don't hear from lecturers or teachers or curriculum. They don't sit exams and they don't do written papers. What they do is we find social entrepreneurs who have from scratch started their own initiatives and we get them to come in and share their story. First of all, they've got to share their motivation. What got them into this? In order to level the room and allow a bit of trust and a bit of bond to happen. Then we ask them in 15 minutes to run through the story of how they got their social enterprise from the start all the way to where they've got it now. Then we stop them and that we've agreed with them prior to them coming that they're going to um, share with the group an issue that nearly um, stopped their innovation, nearly made it go broke, go bust, um, you know, not work. Now, if you ask somebody on the phone, some social entrepreneur on the phone when you're briefing them, can you think of what that issue might be and would you be willing to share it? Believe you me, every single one has an incident or a point in time which was utterly critical. It might have been a governance battle, it might have been a, a staffing issue, it might have been a cash flow issue. So what we do is we then question them, like a witness in a courtroom, around that issue. And basically, through the 12 days that the group are together, over this period of a year, we find witnesses who illuminate 20 areas of hidden curriculum. So the way entrepreneurs learn is not a teacher didactically imparting knowledge in a kind of theoretical way, but more a case of um, listening to practitioners and listening to stories to become aware of the issues that they don't know, to be willing to admit to the issues that they don't know. Well, that witness who's done very well and started the big issue or you know, another great social enterprise, they admitted they didn't know, so I can. And then networked and confident enough to go and find out. And what happens over this period of a year is they all get to know each other and they model each other's behavior in terms of their own leadership style. So a lot of the blocks on people starting, particularly people from poor neighborhoods or, or from difficult backgrounds, a lot of the blocks are not what you might expect. You, you might say that the blocks to people starting and sustaining social enterprises are things like financial management, business planning, you know, HR, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Well, it is those things. It is those hard skills. But actually, you're not going to get out of your bedroom if you don't have confidence, legitimacy, attitude, mindset, persistence, behavior. And you can't teach these softer skills. But if you get together in a group of 20 social entrepreneurs and you hear from practitioners who've been there, seen it and done it, the modeling of that behavior just becomes quite natural. So all of a sudden in the room, after a long period of time where the various case studies play out, all of a sudden, People think, well, if he can do it, I can do it. I'm just going to give you one example, um, which is this chap here. And it, we, I put this little thing here saying one in four fellows um, have direct experience of the social issue they aim to address. So this guy here is Junior, who committed a crime 
Uh, he was part of a gang when he was very young. He was sentenced to 20 years in prison. He served 10 years in prison. Now, the problem for gang-related offences in London is when you get out of prison, you, you get a, a cheque for £100 from the government. So you've got to go back to the same place you came from. Now, if you committed a crime on behalf of your gang, when you go back to that community, even 10 years later, you are the hero because you did this for your gang. So if you don't want to reoffend and you don't want to and you want to reinvent yourself, it's very difficult to do. So he came up with the idea of SOS Gangs Project, which supports gang-related offences in London. Um, they've dealt with over a thousand people, and the reoffending rate has been cut uh, from 73% reoffending within two years to 23% reoffending within two years. Now for the taxpayer, that makes all sorts of sense. It's about £100,000 to keep somebody in prison for a year. It's about £2,000 for the services of SOS Gangs Project. When Junior came and pitched his idea to the Dragon's Den, who were securing places at the School for Social Entrepreneurs, the response was, there's no business model. It's completely philanthropic, dependent. He's never going to sustain this. He's never going to get it off the ground. Because he was from a, a, a difficult background and a poorer community, immediately the people with power decided that because he hadn't worked out the business model beyond philanthropy, because he was dealing in a broken market where the prisoners couldn't come out and pay the £2,000 for the service, immediately the idea was not valid. And Im immediately we would have lost that social innovation. We would also, incidentally, have lost the jobs that he has created. He has created jobs for five full-time ex-gang members who have all served time in prison, who now all have jobs. These are completely unemployable people. So, so I think we've got to be very careful when we're looking at social innovation and we're looking at social entrepreneurship to open the gate to people in communities who otherwise are cut out and the very nature of what they're doing means that they're working in broken markets without an obvious uh, business model or financial engine to sustain and scale their work. What they will do is over a period of time they will get the evidence behind the impact that they're creating and therefore they can begin to transition to sell contracts as opposed to fundraising for their income to sell their outputs and that will allow them to scale and sustain but that that duration and gestation of proving and evidencing impact does take some time so i suppose my plea and my call is to really make sure that we open open the opportunities at the early pipeline stage to ensure that we get people from affected communities offering brilliant and innovative solutions in order that we can scale this for the future. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a seat next to Louise. Um, Alistair Wilson, we will talk more with you later on. Um, and now we will go from the network to the school to policy questions. Uh, we have Beatrice uh, with us, Andros, and she works uh, in the policy lab in the UK cabinet. Welcome up, Beatrice. Hi. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I've worked in the policy lab since we set it up in April 2016, um, 2016, 20, 30, 2014 in the UK government. Um, that came out, um, the lab itself came out of the um, UK Civil Service Reform Plan where it was recognised that government needed to do things differently. It was sort of felt like there was a burning platform. It was like the, the usual stuff isn't working, big financial crisis in 2008 followed by austerity in the new, um, in the new coalition government um, and a feeling that we really needed to do stuff. Um, differently. Um, there'd been prior to the reform plan a, a, a report by the Design Commission which, was, which came from an all-party uh, group of MPs saying we need to 
bring sort of people into the centre of the policy making and use design principles um, to do that. The lo there's loads of really interesting stuff going on outside in the private sector, um, but we're not seeing it being used kind of consistently, certainly in government. Um, so the civil service reform plan said, um, we want to open up policy, uh, we want to design with implementation in mind, we want to put people at the centre. Um, and they also said, oh, and there's a really cool thing in uh, Denmark called uh, Mind Lab, so we'd like something a little bit like uh, that. Um, and of course, our colleagues showing some of the images from Mind Lab later. So I've sort of, uh, earlier, so um, I've, I've sort of sought to, I think what I want to do now is not to talk so much about our process, because I think we've seen some of that in the, uh, in the earlier presentation, but just talk about the way in which it's kind of received in government and um, the sort of challenges of trying to do this in, in the civil service, you know, in a democracy where ministers are ultimately accountable um, and, um, you know, it's big, it's complex, there are constraints. Um, it's difficult to do, but I think um, there have been some sort of small successes along the way. Um, so the idea of the policy lab, uh, we're a really small unit, there's eight people, um, and that's the biggest we've ever been. Uh, Andrea Siodmok, who's our head of lab, is a designer. She worked for the uh, product designer by training and she worked for the design council um, before she came to government. I think one of the reasons that we've managed to kind of make this work so far is having that mix of designers, people with that experience, with, with policy makers like myself and colleagues who have kind of experienced the, the sort of pain and the, the challenges um, and the kind of excitement of, of, of policy making in central government. Um, and I think it's being able to bridge the gap between those two worlds that's been um, a really important thing to do um, and create the kind of permissions, the condition, the, the space for civil servants to, to kind of work in ways that they haven't necessarily um, been used to. Um, we've sought to work on three levels and there was a very clear um, um, brief from the cabinet secretary from others that we needed to be um, building the skills and knowledge. So this isn't about us being a consultancy and just kind of parachuting ourselves into a department, doing some work, kind of handing it back, um, see you later. This is very much a kind of collaborative effort with all of our projects. Um, and it's about building the skills and knowledge of the policy makers um, themselves. So they've got the, the, the capability, but also, I think, crucially, the, the confidence to go out and use um, some of these methods to talk directly with the people who are affected by their services, um, to sort of engage in a much more constructive um, way than they've uh, perhaps been used to. Um, it's quite frightening as a civil servant sometimes going out. They can be quite combative. Um, um, kind of rooms full of people who are not necessarily, uh, and it's difficult to move that into a kind of constructive discussion. So part of the, the, the methods and tools that we introduce people to is to sort of try and create that neutrality and that, that level playing field. And sometimes we can do it by virtue of just sort of not being the department and being seen as slightly removed and slightly independent, albeit we are still part of the cabinet office and government. Um, and what we've also sought to do is that sort of third layer of inspiring new thinking, kind of looking out for interesting innovations outside um, and bringing those into government. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about this is sort of broadly the process that we follow. Um, but as Lisa said earlier, that's <laughs> it's a it's a sort of a gross simplicity. Um, it's really considerably more complex, much less linear than that. But broadly, this idea of going out of sort of trying to understand and define the problem, which which may well change kind of a lot throughout that process, um, going out using ethnographic research techniques, so spending time with people, understanding the world from their perspective, understanding their lives, um, and, um, and um, potentially combining that with sort of bigger uh, data. Um, the, the UK government's got a sort of a, a developing uh, data science capacity, and we also work with external data science um, um, uh, agencies. Um, so we've got both the sort of what's happening from that big data and then drilling down into the sort of why it might be happening through that um, direct engagement with, with people. Um, and f frankly, in many ways, this, the first bit is sort of the easiest bit to get done in government, um, partly because civil servants are sort of, they're used to commissioning research, they're used to getting the results of research. Um, and being able to sort of deal with them and kind of, you know, get interesting stuff from them. Um, they, we might have a bit of a 
kind of battle at the beginning about ethnographic approaches, um, and particularly because we don't tend to work with a, a large numbers of people. It's not about representativeness, it's about getting sort of a depth understanding of what's happening. So we might only talk to kind of eight, 10, 12 people um, who are directly affected by the service. Sometimes we have a mix of, of, of sort of users or, or you know, people who are affected by the policy and those who are delivering it. Um, but it's not a large number of people, and so, you know, some policymakers will just say, there's no way I can go to the minister and say we're basing this policy on, on the experience of eight people. And of course, it's not just about that, but we've, we've sometimes had to meet in the middle a bit more and kind of talk to more people than we actually think it's possibly necessarily necessary to do, um, just to kind of meet some of that. Um, but broadly, once they're kind of on board with that, um, and they get the results and the insights from the ethnography, we use a lot of film. Um, that's been, um, that's taken a while to get people used to receiving information in that way. Normally civil servants get reports, they'll sit there at their desks and read them. They can kind of engage with that, or they don't read them, um, which might be the other thing. <laughs> Am I nearly out of time already? <laughs> <laughs> it's gone very quickly. Um, but they... Um, um, uh, anyway, br basically, when they get the results of this, they quite like it. But the second part of it, um, hopefully we can have some more time for this in the discussion, the kind of uh, developing ideas and starting to try and test and prototype them is really tough in government. Um, the systems are sort of not there. Increasingly, government doesn't have the leverage over the bodies, or over organisations that are delivering for them on the ground. Even with local authorities now in the U uh, United Kingdom, um, there's sort of less and less money being sent from central government to them. So they've just got... They're having to work in a much more collaborative way from the start, and that's what we seek to do in our projects, um, in order to kind of... Um, to ensure that ongoing commitment. Um, I need to stop there. <laughs> I will stop right. there. I had loads more to say, but um, hopefully we'll be able to talk about some of it in the discussion and in the break afterwards. Thank you. Thank you. Beatrice, please. Beatrice, come. Uh, all three of you, come on. Uh, we stand up here. Um, here you are. You can stand over here, Beatrice. And Alice, you can stand oh, oh, here. Okay. Louise, good. Come closer. Okay. <laughs> it's like we're at a bar. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> it, it, it's been interesting to listen to you. And first, I must say, Louise, when I, ha I when I was listening to you, I felt you know a bit more oh pessimistic. You work quite hard. Yeah. You say we're not good enough, right. isn't you know? <laughs> right. <laughs> Are you pessimistic? Is it you know? Is the future black in your in your point of view? Uh, no, the future's not black. And I think all the stuff that we do is amazing. But I do think we do need to do more. And we are, we are still very marginal. I think particularly for me in my world, I spend all my day talking to people that run innovation agencies and design agencies and, and brilliant projects. And, you know, very quickly it feels like the whole world is about social innovation and it's great and we're doing these new <laughs> things for society. And I go and talk to my friends. They've never heard of it. Um, you know, there's people who spend... I have to spend hours telling people what I do. That's ridiculous. But, okay, <laughs> so, so what's the problem? So what's the problem is that we're not enough successful or we're not good enough to announce or talk about it or where is... Where I, think, I think there's a lot of challenges. So I think there's a challenge around, um, around language and narrative and, and you can definitely talk to this from a mm. government perspective. You know, and and there's, a, there's a debate as to whether it's better to do... Um, innovation outside the system and, and obviously you can't you have to start somewhere so you have to start small and grow big but the the question is and again Alistair will be able to talk to this is when we have these entrepreneurs um, and we have these brilliant innovations that, that are about um, uh, people in small communities it, it often just means that they stay in small communities so there's a scale issue and I'm not suggesting that, you know, not every corner shop needs to be a Walmart. Mm -hmm. We need Walmarts and we need corner shops in society. But in terms of social innovation, I think there's still too many mm -hmm. corner shops. So there's a, there's a question about narrative, there's a question about scale, there's a question about how you start this stuff, whether you do it inside and out. But there's a question also about if we still, if we remain marginal in narrative, then when a big challenge comes up, like either the migrant crisis today or the future of our city centres are completely redundant and we have all these things around data, blah, 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 then 
it doesn't really make sense if it's only, you know, five of us on the corner in our little community, <coughs> in our little club, who are doing mm. something about it. Uh, Alistair, do you agree with Louise's picture that we are not good enough? I think there's a, d there's a different way to scale it in terms of a thousand flowers bloom. But the problem with allowing a thousand flowers to bloom and uh, the, the kind of bottom-up stuff that I was describing is that, it's, that economically it doesn't make that much sense. In other words, these social entrepreneurs, their target market, the place they actually want to address, has no money. You know, is, is the last market that the corporates mm. or uh, mm. would mm. go for. So I think there's a disconnect in the entire debate and discussion between our objective, which is poverty, disadvantage, exclusion, and, and the kind of world of social investment, social innovation, social enterprise, and social entrepreneurship, which are seeking out elusive scale. But of course, you've got this economic imperative that that lot don't have any money. Those markets are broken. And yet, we want to transcend to this much bigger, more important, more influential, scalable position. So there's a disconnect there. Yeah. Uh, can I just add as well, I think it's the question that we ask as well. So it's not about, um, you know, it's not about how do, um, you know, how does, uh, what's his name? Junior. Junior. Mm -hmm. How does Junior um, help young people in his area to be safe from crime? The question is more, how do we stop crime at a bigger level? Or how do we, how do we create a society where people feel um, where everybody is uh, provided for and looked after for and comfortable that they don't have to steal from other people. Or, you know, what mm. it's, it's about changing the question mm -hmm. at the top. And I think mm. if we just keep doing these entrepreneur things at the bottom we have to and forget yeah. this top bit, yeah. then... Yeah. But Beatrice, when you see it from, from uh, the government perspective, mm. what could you do to, to raise those uh, good flowers, as Alistair says, and actually make a, a shift in the mind, mind? What can you do? I'm well, I think part of what we are trying to do is kind of is to bring that in government. I think for us, we've got a similar dilemma around kind of at the moment, most of the work that we do is comes from departments who are kind of keen and interested and want to do it. So um, the projects that we're working on are important, but they're not all sort of direct, like of central importance. They're not all at the top of the prime minister's agenda. They're not all the things that kind of really sort of matter to the centre at the moment in the UK government. Mm. Um, we are kind of in something of a dilemma around how we manage that because we don't want to, to there's something in, in government about sort of coming from the centre and telling people how to do things but equally I think we think that for the policy lab uh, to really have impact and to genuinely make a difference we need to be working on some of those kind of really big important things um, and uh, you know obviously at the moment for the Prime Minister in the UK for example that's around um, Brexit, um, but also around uh, social mobility and, and mm. those sorts of questions. So it's something for us about how we kind of help civil servants tackle the big questions. There's something about that second um, um, level I was talking about in helping civil servants get much better generally at kind of at connecting and uh, going out into the world and understanding what's happening and sort of being able to come up with new approaches. But I think I'd echo the point about the sort of um, ambition because... Um, as a policy lab, we're kind of we're invited to many international conferences. We get a lot of international visitors coming to us, and a lot of excitement around what we do, which is amazing for us. But we're really tiny, mm -hmm. and we're not doing. You know, we're do, just. Do you find it difficult to get the, to get the ears of everyone else? Do you find that you are eight person in a policy lab? Uh, is yeah. it hard to you know? I mean, it's hard. It's hard even to judge. You, even if we say, "Oh, Great Britain, you are so yeah. wonderful mm -hmm. in this." Uh, it's hard. I think it's, uh, it's kind of partly what Louise was saying that, that because you're kind of operating in a certain world, so we talk a lot across government and we do meet plenty of skeptics, but we also talk a lot to the people who are like super engaged and super interested and want to do this stuff. Um, and it's quite hard to know across the whole of government where, how much of an impact you're having because mm -hmm. of, you know, the worlds in which you operate. And, so, and, you know, and then you'll go to a part of government that's, that's never heard of any of this stuff that is doing things in the same way it's always done it. Um, and I think, you know, we are very early on in our journey. We've made a very small impact and probably a very small part of government and we hope to be able to do more, but it's, or we haven't found the solution. <laughs> But you're working on it, and that's good. Yeah. Alistair, I was thinking of when you were talking about uh, the importance when you have this school uh, about talking leadership. Uh, 
is there any differences in, in leadership when it comes to uh, social entrepreneurship and, and what you're talking about leadership in classical entrepreneurship? I mean, for sure, the, this balance between money and mission is not a, a balance faced by the commercial counterparts. I mean, they, their proposition is a lot simpler. And you, it's so interesting being with a group of social entrepreneurs through a year. And we, we're working with um, 2,000 social entrepreneurs in five countries every year. But when you're with a group of 20, um, the, a lot of the debate and a lot of the things they're wrestling with throughout the year is how to balance this social impact, how to measure it, how to prove it, how to create more of it, and yet how to create an engine of money in order to do more of it. And, and particularly, how to create that engine of money which is not based on begging or grants mm -hmm. um, or philanthropy in order, one, for it to be more dignified and less Victorian, but two, for it to be sustainable, and three, for it to scale and grow. And, and inevitably, that means proxy markets or kind of pseudo markets because their, their target market has no money. So, so I would say the, the type of learning and leadership needed in social purpose organizations is that bit more complex than their commercial counterparts. Um, and, um, and therefore, it needs that sort of dedicated space for those people to navigate that quite complex proposition. Louise, finally, uh, you were talking about most of the challenges, yeah. that we should be better. Um, we should go up here. We, will be, we should have some Walmarts, mm -hmm. social entrepreneurship Walmarts. Mm. But if you, if you look in the future, where do you think social entrepreneurship will be in 10 years? I God, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> That's a question. Um, I don't know. I hope we will be, I think, I hope our systems will have more capacity. I hope, you know, there'll be lots of little policy labs inside government. I hope that um, universities will be thinking more about themselves as part of communities. Um, as, as here in Malmo, rather than isolated islands that are only for elite people to learn, um, I hope that corporates will recognize that CSR, I, if, if I want someone to paint my wall, I'll get a painter. Um, I don't want KPMG to come and do it. So I hope that corporates will start to recognize and, and use their value um, and use their skills in a different way to benefit society rather than just feeling guilty and, and wanting to do something. So I have no idea what it will be, but I hope that all of our institutions, every single one of them, will embed innovation in the way they do it and have, have more of a social conscious rather than just people like Junior having to have a social conscious because he's been involved in it. Mm. Beatrice Andros from the Pol Policy Lab in the UK Cabinet, thank you for coming. Alistair Wilson from the School of Entrepreneur and Louise Pulford from the Social Innovation Exchange. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. And we won't, we won't give you a book in Swedish, uh, <laughs> though we think your, your Swedish is probably great, but maybe you thank prefer you. chocolate. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>